So the first thing today I want you to think about is this question. What is God's biggest problem? Yes, God has problems. Not that he can't handle them, but he's got to deal with things, doesn't he? He's got problems. So you can think of it this way. What is the main thing that God has to overcome in his creation? Now, to get the answer, uh, we need to think about what his greatest goal is as well, probably, because it kind of stands to reason that his greatest problem will be what's getting in the way of the greatest goal. That's kind of often how it works. And so what's God's greatest goal? And anyone from a good school of reform theology may well say, well, his greatest goal is his own glory. And in some ways that's true. But by the same token, we've got to be careful because God's not arrogant. He will get all the glory in the end because he's God. So it's almost kind of incidental to his purposes. He does have the glory. So what I want us to think about more specifically is in terms of his creation. Like what's he... What's his goal with creation? Where's he trying to get us? And does the Bible specifically tell us the answer to that question? Yes, it does. In very succinct terms, actually. It's um, in Ephesians 1 verse 10. I don't have to turn that. It's just actually one part of that verse. Ephesians 1 10 is the answer. So there's God's greatest goal. Ephesians 1 10 says, to unite all things in him. Him being Jesus Christ, right? That's the context in there. So he wants to unite everything in Christ. Which is kind of like how he finished last week, isn't it? For those who are here, the few of you who were here last week. Remember that we saw uh, from him and through him and to him are all things. Romans 11, 36. Okay, so he wants everything in Christ. Okay, so if that's the goal, what's stopping that goal? There's a What's the little devil thing? No, it's not really the devil, actually. Even though he, he um, epitomizes it pretty well. But don't think of it. I'm just trying to symbolize what it is. There's a, something in the way. So sin is part of it, yes, but the human heart from sin is pride. Pride is where it starts. So pride is the main thing getting in the way of God reaching his goal. All right, then, so if you were God, what would you think you'd have to do to get pride out of your creation so that they could be in a position to turn to you in humility? Because that's the only way for it to work properly. Well, it's because that's the only posture with which we can genuinely approach God in truth. So how do you humble the proud, in other words? In a word, discipline. So what might that look like in our lives? What might discipline look like in our lives? Well, we saw a bit of that last week in Psalm 38. And in many ways, Psalm 39 is very much a continuation of Psalm 38. It's a very similar theme. It seems to come from a very similar place in David's life. And David showed us that God's discipline was seen in the hard times in his life. So some of those hard times were brought on by David's own sin. And some may not have been. Some is just stuff that happened that's not connected with this indirectly. But in it all, David revealed to us that it's really only in the difficulties of life that we are ready to admit our weaknesses and submit to God. So we need those difficulties to bring us to that place. Now, is God doing that for his own sadistic pleasure? Is he just enjoying, ha ha, look at you guys suffer? Does that sound like God? No, it's not. Absolutely not. God's not like that. And we see he's got a goal, hasn't he? So he's doing it so he can bring his beloved children home, fully grown. So yes, that's the goal, to bring his children home in Christ. So that's why it's in the goal mouth there. (laughs) So bring his children home. But they are naturally full of pride. We're born like that, which prohibits fellowship with God, to, to know God as we should. So in his grace, he works to bring them to an end of themselves, us, so they might turn to him in faith and repentance. That's the plan. So that's what life's all about in a nutshell. God has to bring us to that place so we we turn to him in repentance. And that's the attitude we see in today's psalm, Psalm 39, which I'm sure you picked up as we read it. It's that very humble attitude. It's a deep lament from David about the, the frailty and sinfulness of all mankind, but especially himself. 
and that God is the only answer to, to this weakness in all of us. So yes, let's have a look, because it may well be where many of us are right now, feeling kind of in that sort of spot. Yes, and it's, it's a bit sad, but we need to acknowledge the whole range of emotions that we have life, if we're going to be able to deal with all of life's ups and downs. It's not all happy clappy. We've got to get the reality of life. That's where Psalms is like, I said, Psalms is so good. So the title of the psalm is this, to the choir master, to Jejuthun, a psalm of David. So it seems this was written by David to be led in public worship by Jejuthun, one of the top worship leaders in David's court, with Heman and uh, the other guy, I forget his name, but there's a few he names in his psalms. Um, so it's interesting, isn't it, that, that point, because this is a very personal psalm, you've noticed, it's very personal, all his insides are coming out. So can you imagine having your dirty laundry, the whole congregation singing it to praise God? It's like, this is, he's very brave, isn't he? So, but that was David's heart, open and honest about the realities of life, because that's how we connect with people and, and with God, to be honest. So David starts out in verse 1. I said I will guard my ways that I, that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. Now, he said a very similar thing in the last psalm, except that this time the situation is a, a little bit different. So in Psalm 38 he continued to hold his tongue because it was the wisest way to defuse the attacks of the enemy because they were hassling him so he just didn't say anything to respond. So like I said, led, led like a lamb like Jesus. He didn't respond to his enemies. This time in Psalm 39, he eventually does let fly. But as we'll see shortly, there's a lesson in how he does that too. Okay, so, so it's just a bit of an extension on from last time. But for now, he's just trying to not give the wicked who are hassling him any, any more ammo. Because that's what you do. If you respond to them, you'll end up giving them ammo and they'll just attack you worse. Because okay, he realizes his own propensity to say something he might regret. Anyone... Um, a bit like that with yourself yeah. <laughs> when you say things you wish I didn't say that and he doesn't want to sin like that so he just zips his lip so zip your lip that's what's on the sheet there if you want to so thinking about that for ourselves how's your self control when someone's you know when someone's right up in your face provoking you how do you respond it might be different at different times depending on how you're feeling but um, is, is there anger or is there fear? Or is there even hatred sometimes? You just hate that person so much. Whatever you feel, it's often the wisest response to hold your tongue, isn't it? Verse 2. I was mute and silent. I held my peace to no avail and my distress, distress grew worse. Okay, so maybe we can keep, it, you know, keep a lid on it for a while, but each minute that passes puts more fuel on the fire for the, something's going to explode, doesn't it? Sometimes it's just like that. It can be a real test for our self-control and our patience. And like David, I think most of us can only be pushed so far before we're going to you know, take the lid off the, the bottle and off we go. Now that's no excuse to lash out, as we're about to see. There is a right, right way of dealing with this. But for now the pressure keeps building. Verse 3. My heart became hot within me. As I mused, the fire burned and then I spoke with my tongue. All right, so he just, he just got too much, you know, the pressure built too much. He just can't keep it in anymore. And he lets fly at his, enemy, at his enemies, right? No, is that what he does? Nope. David is facing a different direction. And the substance of what he's going to say will summarize, we will summarize with the phrase, man is a vapor. So that's this next section. But the important thing to note first is who he's talking to. We think he's going to go at his enemies. No, he doesn't retaliate to the wicked. Instead, verse 4, O oh Lord. Yes, he turns to God and to let his frustrations out. And oh, how many of us need to learn this lesson. Pour out your heart to God. Now, of course, there are times when we just really need to let off steam to a friend or to a family member about something that's got us worked up. And, the, you know, of course, there's, that's fine in its place. We need to do that sometimes. But remember two things I think we get out of this. Don't lose it at your opponent. That'll most likely just make things worse and just show weakness really and show that you can't handle it. So don't attack them. And do make sure God is the ultimate port of call for offloading your troubles because he's always right there and he cares. 
So yes, you can talk to your close friends just to, to help, but if you remember those two key things, that'll certainly help. Because even though you can't see God with your natural eyes, he's absolutely right there. How do I know that? Well, if you're a believer, because the Holy Spirit indwells all believers, right? And I'm very firm on that point. There's some who say he comes later, but no. As soon as you believe, I believe God's word is very clear on that. But if you're not a believer, he can still hear your genuine prayer. So do, do call to him if you feel, you know, feel, that, um, feel that repentance that you, have, that you should have. But if you are a believer, you have a rock-solid knowledge that he's right there riding the bumps with you. He's right with you. And that's something that even David couldn't say necessarily because he lived before Jesus resurrected. So we're very blessed in the church age. So let's make the most of our privilege that God's Spirit is with us all the time for eternity. So pray to God at all times. Okay, so what does David ask from God then? Does he say, Lord, please take the nasty people away. I can't deal with it anymore. Or does he say, give me the words to win the argument? No, not those either. That's a far humbler response. Make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Now, hang on, is that really what we need to know in these situations? I'm being attacked here, so Lord, please help me feel worse about myself. You could sort of summarise it that way, couldn't you? Actually, yes, that is the right thing. Because David can see what's really going on here. This is God's discipline coming to him. Yes, the person in his face may well be in the wrong, but that act- that's actually irrelevant for the relationship between David and God. What if, what's happening to him is irrelevant. What's happening to David is what he has to deal with, whether, whatever the reason for it. So God will deal with the wrong on the other guy in his own time, but this is all about teaching David to approach God the right way. If we try and look down on God... We'll miss him. If you take a high position and look down on God, you'll miss him because he's above us, if you want to think of it that way. Instead, we need to approach with humility, understanding our weakness compared to his wisdom and greatness and majesty and all those things that I could list off for an hour. Look at God is. So once we are in that low place, we're actually getting the correct view of the situation because God is up here and we are down here. So many people try to come to God and judge him because you know, I know best because I'm... You know, that's why I, I, me, me, me. That's not how it is. We need to understand the, the correct orientation to God and all relationships must be based on truth for them to work properly. And the truth is that we are just a vapour on this earth. Verse 5. Behold, you have made my days just a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Selah. And just on the Selah, the, this is the first one we've encountered for quite a while in the psalm series. So you might have forgotten what it refers to. Um, and there is debate, but I think most likely meaning is that it's, it's just a pause to reflect, and whether it's musical one or I'm not sure, but the idea is just to pause to reflect because it's so often placed after something to sort of underline it, which is quite appropriate. At this point of the psalm, we need to truly understand our smallness and in- inability to do anything of eternal value without God. So we are like a breath of steam on a winter's morning and we're very familiar with that, living in Collie. If you go outside, I take it. We all have to. Um, You know, the breath is gone before you know it in the scheme of things. In our days, we're being measured, um, if if days were being measured on a road, say, it would just be a few handbreadths of distance and on on a journey and a handbreadth is one of the shortest measurements they had. It's just across the four fingers, that's a handbreadth. So... Using, measuring a journey like that would take a long time, wouldn't it? So that's kind of the idea he's getting at. It's not our part of our journey is very small. Part of the, the overall journey of history. And even though we've paused to reflect on that truth with the sailor there, David continues on the same line still in verse six. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. So man just means mankind there, that's what's they, so it's plural, really. Uh, and the imagery there is of a far- farmer piling up his grain, which represented his wealth in those cultures, right? So if you've got lots of grain, you've got lots of wealth. So that's why I've got the picture up there. So now David looks at the futility of not just human beings, 
but also, also the things they live for in this world. Okay, all that stuff is uh, temporary as well. And he says there, surely for nothing they are in turmoil. So in other words, people who are just trying to pile up more and more stuff, they're stressing about the wrong things. Surely for nothing they're in turmoil to try and get rich. You know? People tire themselves out to get rich, but for what? In the end, what does it get them? Because we'll all pass on one day and then who knows what's going to get what you've worked so hard to amass. It just goes to the next person and they might waste it all on rubbish. So what is David's point that he's trying to get across here? We'll summarise it in this word, perspective. Eternity on the other side of death is way more significant than life now. So we need to live with that as the goal. Okay? There's this much now and that much then. So let's get our proportion of thinking correct. So we don't want to let things that come in that try and distract our attention um, just because they're right before us in the here and now. That's, they seem more important. Ultimately, they, they're used in the, in the eternal scheme because they all fall away in the end. Because there really is only one thing that goes with us to the other side. One thing. It's whatever's in the human heart. So that, therefore, we should just tease that out a little bit. So that includes our own hearts, of course. So our relationship with God is our number one responsibility. It's the only thing we really take with us to the other side, right? If you don't have one, then you have nothing on the other side. And that, of course, includes our character that he builds in us through, through that relationship. So however we, much we grow, that's um, what we carry with us to, the, to heaven. All of the things that make, a, make the essence of our being do go beyond death. So that's who we really, truly are. And then the other thing that crosses over is the effect that we've had in the lives of others. So that's some of the fruit that we can have in our lives, is how we affect others. What fruit did we bring to their lives, to other people's lives? That's another thing we need to weigh up. So that is also what we should be committing ourselves to, right? Giving ourselves for the eternal good of others. Literally everything else will be burnt up. So, David is trying to remind us of that perspective here. Okay, This is all temporary. We, do, we get new bodies, don't we? That's, that's a cool thing. But that's uh, not, not this current one. So even this one kind of gets burnt up, in a sense. So, yes, everything... David's trying to give us that perspective about the eternal perspective. So he carries that idea over into the next section now, which we'll call, as it says there in this verse, my hope is in you. And this verse is actually the central verse in the psalm, literally in a number of verses. It's the middle one. So it's interesting that it also kind of summarizes the whole psalm too, doesn't it? So it's the theme verse, if you like, verse 7. And now, O Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. So he's just looked at all, the, at all the people around him who are stressing to get rich. That's, that was the context, wasn't it? Verse 6 there. And the, to get status and, and all the things they... and earn people's love and all that kind of thing that people try and earn in this life. But he simply says, all that stuff isn't what I live for. I'm not waiting to get rich. God, you are my only hope. And David was rich. I, mean, I don't know exactly what stage of life this was, but he's a king. You know, he had plenty. But he realized that was all nothing. God, you are my only hope. You are the only one who's worth living for. Now, if we apply this lens, this perspective that he's trying to give us, if we apply it to ourselves, what does it show? So there's a bit of self-reflection here. If someone looked at your use of time and your money, looked at your bank accounts in detail, and all the time and effort you put into whatever you put into in life, what would they conclude about what matters to you? So I want you to think about that. I mean it right now. Have a think about where's your money going? Where's your time put into? What does that tell? If someone has an objective look at your life, what, what does it tell you about where your values are? Especially your free time. And I'm doing this on myself as well. I'm not saying just you, but it's just personalised it a bit more. So where does your mind turn to when you get some time to yourself? What's the first thing it goes to? And yes, we do get free time sometimes, believe it or not. So then, then think, 
what does that tell you about your priorities? When, which is the first place for your mind to go? I'm not saying you have to jump straight into the Bible every single time, but, you know, let's look at where our priorities, where our life reveals our priorities. This is the kind of reflection we all need to be doing constantly, trying to step outside our own thoughts and say, what would someone think if they looked at me? Or what would God think? More the point. So if we don't do that reflection and we just live according to instinct, you know, our life will be over and we'll wonder what we really achieved. Because we need to be aware that this side of heaven, we will be having a constant battle with sin. If you're not having a constant battle with sin, you're missing, the, you know, you're missing what's actually coming because there is sin challenging you all the time. So we can't let our guard down. And again, David is a good example of someone with this awareness. Verse 8. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. Now, do keep in mind that when we first turn to God as believers, we are fully forgiven from that moment on. Okay, So our transgressions are forgiven. So why does David have to ask God to deliver him from his transgressions later in his life? Because like I said, we don't know exactly when this psalm was written, but it appears to be quite later on. This is a bit of a hint there, later in the, in the psalm. <coughs> well, so what does being delivered from transgression, transgressions mean here? Well, there's more than one sense of being delivered, right? In the second phase of our salvation, we are delivered from sin's penalty. Sorry. We're not, sorry, not delivered from sin's penalty. That's phase one. That's already done at the cross. We got delivered from the penalty of sin in phase one. We are delivered from sin's power in, sin, in, in stage two as we grow. That means we work with God over time as he breaks our addiction to all those things that don't honour him. And breaking addictions can be painful, can't it? can be awfully hard. But we all have those addictions we need to break. So there is that progressive deliverance of our character and behaviour. That's what I think David has in mind here, even though you know, we are like forgiven at the start, but we're now delivered progressively over time. So that's one way to avoid the scorn of a fool, to, to give him less targets for attacks as well in our lives by having less, less things that we're doing silly. And again, the best way to deal with that kind of thing is to keep your mouth shut. Verse 9. I am mute. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. Yes, God is the one who does the deliverance, and he's also the one who leads the defense against the accusation from the enemy. So let's kind of you know, get out of the way, and let God do his thing. That's kind of what he's saying there, because our hope should be in him. Okay, so as we talked about before, maturing to the point where we have an attitude like this takes time. Okay, we all, God knows that. He, he, this way he works with us gently, but firmly at the same time. But it's not just time, it's time under the discipline of God that matters. So God loves us enough to work to correct our errors and remove our sin. And it hurts, like I said, um, all discipline does. You can read about that in Hebrews 12, there's a, lot of, there's a big section about discipline there. But it's absolutely necessary. But that doesn't mean God won't listen when we, if, if we tell him that we think we've had enough for now. You know, he's, Lord, that's enough. So this is where David gets into that kind of thing in verses 10 and 11, which is all about God's discipline. So that's what we've called that section. Verse 10, Remove your stroke from me. I'm spent by the hostility of your hand. Now the word stroke there doesn't mean like stroke a cat. That's... God's not, he's not talking about that kind of stroke at all. Here he's implying the idea of actually a whip or a rod, actually. Um, now, don't let that put you off. That's just how correction was pictured in David's day. And honestly, it's how it was pictured all the way up until probably the last 30 or 40 years. Discipline was with a rod, perhaps. Now it's all about being sent to your room or being grounded or something, and not that that's bad, but that's kind of the number one thing now. now I'm absolutely not knocking that. Um, they're all useful tools for parenting. But I have to say, earlier generations were made of sterner stuff, I think. Physical punishment was normal, but it's not so much now. But anyway, just so you know, that's the idea there, and don't let it freak you out, as, as is the idea of God's hand pressing down. That's the other idea behind this. Now, we saw this idea in the previous psalm, the idea of God's hand pressing down again. That's in verse 2 of Psalm 38. It's another common image of affliction. And uh, the idea that God is putting you under pressure or putting you through a squeezy spot. That's kind of the idea of, uh, of being in affliction as well. 
Um, it's, it's maybe a little more palatable to modern ears, the idea of just God putting you under pressure. Or is this one as well, if you'd rather, perhaps the idea of the picture you can think of as like the potter's hand on the soft clay. He puts pressure to shape just how he wants it. So you know, God can't mould a clay pot without pushing on it, can he? That's how pot- pottery works. I understand I'm not very good. I've done it once maybe in my life. Um, but God is very good at it. And that's why he has to put pressure just the right place, just the right time. It's that skill of, of doing that. Um, you know, the right amount of pressure on the right place at the right time makes the pot just right. So that's what he's doing with us. He's shaping us. So naturally, that is changing the pot, which we don't often, and we don't often like change, do we? We want to we be constant. Everything just how it is. I like it the way it is. Leave me alone. But it's necessary, isn't it? We, we're going to be, if we're going to be ready for eternity with God, we have to have this, some change. But really, however you want, to, you want to look at the way God shapes us, the idea is that we need to be made uncomfortable before we really experience transformation. So that's how life works. Uncomfortable. So this is what God cares enough to do for us all through our life. He makes us uncomfortable, so we'll reach out to him. And David does, does so, and he says, Enough, Lord, I've had, it, had, it, I've had enough. I think I've learned my lesson. Verse 11. When you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. Surely all mankind is a mere breath. Selah. Yes, we do need to t- take time for that. Again, seller reflection, when God is disciplining us, we've got to reflect on it and go, I see what's happening. And it's not like something strange is happening, like I think Peter says that. It's not strange, it's just God doing his work. But do see in that verse another hint about the purpose of discipline. It's to break the stranglehold that our misplaced desires have on us. So things that we want, you know. And like a moth that kind of you know, disappears into powder when you hit it. See, that's a funny picture of that, like I thought. Um, moths just go poof, when you hit them. So that's kind of like what God needs to do with the things that we're holding on to too tightly in this life. When he's ready to grow us again, he may well take away things in our life that we tend to be holding on to in place of God. You know, we, idols in our lives. He'll get them and poof, and they'll go. And that way it won't, won't, won't feel good, but it needs to happen. And if I may be frank with you this morning, I think right now it may be one of those times for a lot of people. Our faith in a lot of things and a lot of people is being shaken right now. And I think God is stepping right up to many of us and saying, all right, who do you really trust? When things are being shaken up, where's the solid ground? And on that note, I find it interesting this week that Melbourne had an earthquake, didn't it? just out of Melbourne but it was affected and it damaged some buildings so sometimes God can be a little more literal than we prefer can't he Uh, but yes surely I I truly believe God is asking not just Melbourne but the whole of Australia right now and let's face it the world really so who do you really trust he's putting that right front and centre and as C.S. Lewis famously said in his book The Problem of Pain God whispers to us in our pleasures speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So I think that's that's bang on. So I hope we can collectively answer that call well, but it's not looking promising at the moment. So I guess at least in our individual answer, hopefully we all answer well individually. Yes, I trust you, Lord. And just keep stepping out in that trust in God. So I hope that's how we are. And of course, David gives us uh, a blueprint for a good response as he wraps up verses 12 to thir- in, in verses 12 to 13, the end of the psalm there. He's only seeking God for answers. And in a sense, he asks God to listen, but don't look. <laughs> Let me, I have to explain that. So let's read it. Verse 12. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears, for I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my father's. So again, David hits that point that this life is only temporary, just passing through. Figuratively speaking, we shouldn't be building our empire structures and all those things here on earth, right? We're not here for long enough. We're just traveling like in a tent. So we put up a tent and fold down the tent and move on. Because if life is, as David has been saying, a breath, 
Let's pick some of the other things he said. Uh, vapor, fleeting, just a few hand breaths, breaths, a shadow. If that's what life is like, then what are so many of us doing living like this is all there is? I think it's mainly because we have natural eyes and live in the natural world and it's very easy just to live with those blinkers on because that's just what we see around us, right? But through faith in Jesus and in his word, we can know for certain that there's so much more beyond. Our natural eyes can't see it, but it's no less real. In fact, it's even more real because it's forever, right? It lasts forever. And God is the eternal God, the God of forever. So that's who we should be getting to know. He's the one we should be spending our time and efforts to get to know. He's really the only thing that gives meaning to everything else because he's the eternal reality. And I hope everyone here this morning can see that truth. So David certainly did, which is why he desperately reaches out to God in his pain. He just needed God to listen to him in his troubles, as we all do, don't we? We just call out to God. But at the same time, while he wanted his ear, he wanted God's ear, he at this moment had had enough of his exacting eye, (laughs) searching out his sin. Verse 13, Look away from me, that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. Now that sounds like an awfully depressing end to this psalm, doesn't it? And yes, it is, but only if we take the short-term view. So this is kind of the point, I think. Only if we take the short-term view is this as depressing as it sounds. You know? So we need to take the long-term view. But David is highlighting the transience of life by how he finishes this psalm. And that if his goal in life is only to be happy, and how many times have you heard people say that, you know, um, usually about someone else, I just want her to be happy. I just want Uncle Freddie to be happy or whatever. So if that's all we want in life is to be happy, what's David saying about that? Well, prepare to be disappointed. True happiness is a byproduct of fulfillment, not an end to aim for in itself. If you aim for happiness, you'll miss it, like proper happiness. You might get some fun or some light-hearted things, but it's not true happiness. If God, and if God is trying to exert discipline on you because he loves you, but your only goal is to feel good, you'll be seriously dissatisfied and you'll not grow the way you should. You'll miss the point of the discipline. And you'll therefore miss the very thing you're actually aiming for. You're trying to aim for happiness, but you'll miss it. You'll get it if you submit to the discipline, which is kind of backwards. You kind of think that's backwards, but that's how it works. And then since we all die, that will be the end of that if, that's, if you're trying to just look for happiness in the discipline. And then if you don't have faith in Jesus, that is the end of your possibility of any happiness if you've avoided God your whole life. But in contrast, David knows that this life is not all there is. So for him, departing and being no more on this earth, um, which is not annihilation, by the way, just that's, which is what some people say, ceasing to exist is what he means. It's not that. He's just talking about no longer walking on this earth. And that is actually a release and a great promotion for those who believe, right? We, all, we know that. Because that's the time that God's discipline will be over because he will have done his work of growing us up and we will be ready for eternity with him. And we will all die precisely on time. I hope you understand that. Yep, no one dies ahead of time. Even though it might seem so to us sometimes. So yes, David is still a man living in this fallen world as we are, you know, all of us. So he feels the stresses and pains and doubts like, just like we do. Which is why this psalm is really all about what verse 7 summarized. For what do I wait? My hope is in you. So is that something you and I can say today? Is the lure of this world and its trappings and pleasures getting stronger on you or weaker? Obviously it's supposed to be getting weaker, right? That's where we're supposed to go. Because as you and I get closer to God, he'll get bigger in our mind. As you get closer to God, he'll be bigger in your mind's eye and the world will fade more and more into the background. And even though our fallen side kind of balks at that idea that we might have to give things up, that, that we hold dearly, you know, things that are worldly things, that really is best for us in the end. And that is how God deals with, with his and our biggest problem. Remember the biggest problem? Pride. So that's what he's 
working to get rid of. He loves us so much that he paid for our sin, which as you said before, all comes from pride. Pride's a source of sin. And then he puts his own spirit in us to drive it out of our hearts as well. He's there working to get rid of pride in our hearts. So we need to increasingly develop that spirit-enlightened eternal perspective and learn to let the world go. So that's kind of what I want to leave to you, that idea. Let the world go. It hates you anyway. Let's be frank about it. The world hates us. The, The central essence of the world. It's just trying to make us feel good to deceive us and bring us down. And remember, the fact that we're like a vapour should help us keep our perspective true, right? Let's keep looking to our hope in Jesus and we'll find that letting go is much easier and much, much better as well. So let's pray. Well, thank you for David's perspective here of seeing eternity with you as the greatest thing. Lord, help us to have that perspective too. Please may it shape our lives and help us to pursue that relationship with you because you give us that opportunity even now. Lord, we're such privileged people. But even greater is coming and we thank you. So help us to remember that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.